participants, you will be able to ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A panel that you can find at the bottom or at the top of your Zoom window. Please feel free to use them at any point and we will be having a, a questions and answer time at the end of the presentation, which will be roughly 30 minutes. So now the floor is yours and you can go whenever you're ready. Okay, so I will start um, briefly like our talk. We, are, we decided to, to mix our presentation all together, so we will alternate during the presentation. And we will speak about uh, actually how it's working in laboratory in astrophysics. That is something that is not really uh, in the common sense, because it's usually when we think about astrophysics, astronomy, we think about the universe and observing the universe with telescopes and spacecraft. But on the other side, there is a lot of work to do on Earth, as uh, Melissa was saying. And uh, this work from our side, it's mostly in the laboratory. So going to the first uh, uh, part of our presentation, I will start like introducing you a little bit what is working in laboratory. So next slide. And we see that imagine that we have uh, space bodies that could be in this case on asteroids and we can observe it uh, with a telescope next or we can observe next with um, uh, spacecraft and uh, and other like space like other like um, space exploration probe like rover and uh, <laughs> lander. Imagine that all these instruments are acquiring data. They are like making measurement, a lot of different kind of measurement, infrared and also cameras, pictures, uh, more I would say in-depth analysis on the atomic structure and the uh, composition of these surfaces. But what we receive on Earth is just the observation. It's not the uh, explanation of what we are observing. So as you can imagine, the work, the real work, the real scientific work starts when these observations arrive on Earth, at least for the scientists involved in the project. Part of this work, part of the interpretation of the results can be done through modeling. So just using uh, algorithm and math in order to uh, think about and to simulate what we are observing and to understand what we are uh, uh, observing in these planetary surfaces. On the other side, a very important role is covered by laboratory because with laboratory, we can really simulate the condition and the environment that we have in the space, the sample, the same composition that we have in the space and take measurement that can be directly compared. So going to next slide. Let's imagine, let's make a, a kind of you know, uh, example to understand how laboratory works um, can help space exploration. Now, this is a picture of uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover that is actually on Mars and is taking measurements. So if we go next, we see like um, Mars 2020 taking measurement of some rocks and these have an outcome that is on some data, some scientific data. But in principle, we don't know what, what was observed by uh, Perseverance. We don't know what was the composition of the rocks that Perseverance is observing. So we can go back in the lab and make some measurement on what we think is the best analog for the surface of Mars in this case. So we will obtain some result. And with this result, maybe we will be able to interpret the data. So using this result, we will go back to the data and hopefully <laughs> we hope to understand the composition of Mars. So as you can imagine, more data we have on Earth, on laboratory, more we will be able to interpret the data that are coming from the space mission. So uh, just to give another like very fast overview on what we can do in lab now, not, not what we are doing here in Camilo, but what we can do in general for astrophysics in lab. Going to next slide, we will see some different kind of facility. These are two facilities in NASA Goddard 
On the left, you see an X-ray diffraction uh, facility to study the composition, the atomic composition and the crystalline structure of mineral. On the other side, always in NASA Goddard, there is a, a facility to uh, study mass spectroscopy and so to analyze uh, the volatile, the most light component of compounds. So we evaporate and we uh, desorb uh, the most light component like hyces and gas from a compound that we can analyze that. But this is not the only thing that we can do in lab. If you go to, to the next slide, <coughs> sorry. We have, these are two pictures from my past facility where I was working in Florence. On the left, uh, there is a spectrometer to investigate the electromagnetic spectrum that can go from the ultraviolet to the, through the visible to the infrared, but it's not enough. We can study the chemical composition of liquid solution. So through our liquid chromatography that you see on the right, we can uh, uh, take a sample, maybe, uh, study the chemical and organic composition, just uh, washing the mineral and extracting uh, what is the, the chemical component of the mineral. And this is like just part of the laboratory, the laboratory studies that we can do on Earth and uh, that requires sometimes very big instrument. I just not mentioned the other technique like scanning electron microscope or even more precise technique that can go really into the atomic structure of the sample. But this is not the end, because if we go to the next slide, what we can do also in laboratory and uh, let's say in a laboratory close to our planet, on the right, on the left, you see a simulation facility of DLR to simulate the Mars, the planet Mars. So in that, in that little chamber, we can recreate the condition of Mars with the atmosphere and the illumination and see what happens to mineral molecule and even more evolved like uh, uh, life being like lichens, bacteria and uh, study the evolution and the survival of these um, compounds or these living being on Mars condition. As I say, also we can use kind of laboratory that are not really on the ground of Earth they are in the space. The uh, International Space Station is a, an extreme uh, powerful laboratory to understand how the space environments can influence material like mineral and molecule or even bacteria. Uh, what you see in the picture is the exposed facility from ESA, that is a, uh, I would say an instrument to expose some components to the space, to the radiation of the sun in the empty space. Then these components have to be bring back on the ground on Earth, where again in the lab we can understand what was the effect of the space environment on this material. So, as I show you, we can do really a lot of uh, different um, technique. We can use a, really a lot of different technique for investigate what we think are the best analog of. Uh, planetary surfaces, asteroids, Mars, icy moons. In particular, me and Camilla are working with the spectroscopy, the infrared and the electromagnetic spectroscopy. So on the next slide, I will just give a very, very short uh, introduction to everyone about uh, the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's like um, that part of um, of the of the universe that we cannot see most of the time with our, with our eyes. We can see only the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum with our eyes, but we know that it's not composed just from the visible light, but also the ultraviolet, the infrared. And if we move to more, I would say, extreme uh, uh, um, wavelengths, so more extreme frequency, we have X-ray, gamma ray, microwave, and radio wave on the other side. All this uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum is linked with the wavelength, is linked with the frequency of the wave, of the electromagnetic wave, but it's also linked with the temperature. So as you can imagine, we can use the electromagnetic spectrum in order to make analysis of the compound that we observe. So if we go next, we will see how using gamma ray and X-ray 
spectroscopy, we can go down to the atomic and subatomic structure. So we can investigate the real structure of the matter, so the, the crystalline structure and the, and the, I would say, even below the crystalline structure, down to the, inside the atom that, that like uh, form the matter. Moving to ultraviolet, visible and infrared, we can study the solid matter. So something that is more, I would say, uh, close to our uh, perception. So molecules, minerals, the surface of a planet. I would say using these three uh, wavelength range, we can really have a lot of data on the composition, on the bulk composition of the surfaces. If we move to microwave and radio, we can have, uh, we'll say, a large scale uh, vision of the universe. So these are wavelengths that are mainly used by astronomers that are studying the nebulas, the interstellar medium, and the galaxy in the universe. So for us, planetary scientists, we are in the middle, I would say, shifted a little bit toward the this atomic and subatomic. But for me and Camillo, mostly, we are really in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum working with the infrared spectroscopy, uh, visible and ultraviolet spectroscopy. And so now we will let the floor to Camillo to speak about, I would say, a little bit of our work. OK, so uh, continuing with what Giovanni was saying, we'll talk about one concrete example of uh, something that we can study in the lab to understand processes that take place in space, uh, more specifically in our solar system, where uh, most of the planetary science is focused on. Uh, so before I go into that, uh, I always like sharing this image because uh, this is kind of the, the classic perception that everyone has of the solar system. So when you think what's in the solar system, we usually think, you know, there's the sun, there's some planets, uh, there's some spacecraft, uh, human-made spacecraft is orbiting planets or flying around. Uh, there's some comets, some moons, and some other planets, but, um, and then everything else is just empty, cold space. Maybe it will be hot if you're looking at the sun, uh, but in reality, uh, space and our solar system is a lot more chaotic than that. So even though it's empty, it's not really just quiet and cold. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of energy going on around the, the solar system. And a lot of it is coming from our sun. So the sun is a hot ball of gas or plasma, and uh, there's constantly particles and stream of, of things, energy coming out of it in, in terms of uh, ions, electrons, but also in terms of light of different energies. So we can see the visible light from the sun, but there's also UV rays, as we've heard. There's X-rays coming from the sun. So all of this energy coming from the sun is flying to the solar system, and it's kind of encountering planets, asteroids, spacecraft on the way as it flies away from the sun. And there's also uh, dust particles that are flying at high velocities around the solar system, probably from uh, older stages of the solar system or from impacts that took place many, many years ago, millions of years ago. And so they're just particles flying around at high velocities. And they also encounter planets, asteroids, moons eventually. So that's what we call meteorites when they come here to Earth and they fall onto the, the surface of the Earth. And also there's energy coming from outside the solar system. So there's other events very far away uh, in other solar system where there's uh, supernova or other events in the, in the universe that could eventually send energy towards the solar system. So there's different kind of uh, radiation coming from outside the solar system all the way. So all this kind of chaotic soup of different types of energies and, and things are going around the solar system. And one of the effects that this causes is what uh, we call space weathering. Um, so as I was saying, there space is filled with different types of particles or different types of energy. And we usually char uh, characterize them in two groups. So one is particle and then the other one is uh, light. So particles tend to be very small, like I was saying, electrons or ions, which are atoms that are ionized. So they're lacking their equilibrium with the electrons and they're flying through the solar system. And then the micrometeorites, which are these dust particles that are coming from uh, impact events or from earlier stages of the solar system. 
And there's also uh, light, so just photons of different types of energies. So visible, but also UV, X-rays, and gamma rays, which we focus more because those are the ones that have usually enough energy to create changes on the structure of, of materials. So one type of bodies that we can find in the solar system is the airless bodies. Uh, and these are basically, or mostly asteroids and moons that lack uh, uh, atmosphere. So a, a layer of gas surrounding it and also a magnetic field. So here on Earth, we are very lucky and that's why we are here is because we have this nice layer of gas that is protecting us from a lot of this radiation and particles that are flying around in the, in the solar system. So uh, I, call it, I like to call it like some, some sort of sunscreen. So the, the same way when you go to the beach and you put on some sunblock to protect yourself from the UVs from the sun, uh, in a similar way, the atmosphere is like the sunscreen for, for Earth, and it protects it from a lot of this high energy light and these particles that are flying to space. But in the case of airless bodies, because they don't have this sunscreen layer, uh, then they, all this energy actually gets down to the surface and it's constantly impacting it, delivering energy. And so asteroids will get sunburns and they'll undergo different changes in their properties because of that energy that is being deposited on them. And these changes, if we study things in the lab, and because here we those uh, minerals that we study in the lab will not be exposed to this kind of radiation because they'll be protected by our atmosphere, then they won't be sunburned, and the changes that take place in the asteroids will make them look very different from what we look here on Earth. So uh, the story of this goes that at the beginning when they discovered this effect is that things didn't look the same way when they were in space that when they were here on Earth, even though they were like the same composition. So uh, to study this kind of effects, um, we like simulating this environment in the lab and there's different ways we can do that. Uh, and when I say we, as uh, Giovanni also said, I'm not talking just like Giovanni and me, I'm saying like the scientific community in general, uh, we like doing different uh, approaches to simulate specific types of interactions of the different types of radiation and energy in space with the surface of these airless bodies. So uh, there's people that focus on simulating micrometeorite impact. So dust particles that even though they're so tiny, maybe thinner than uh, a human hair, they're flying so fast through space that they have enough energy to, that when they hit things, they will cause a lot of chaos. And so there's two ways you can simulate that in the lab. So the first one is the one you can see on the left, which is actually accelerating dust particles in the lab at very high velocities and then putting a target. So think of it like putting a rock that has a similar composition of the rocks that you can find on the moon or on an asteroid and then accelerating those dust particles at high velocities and heating those rocks that you're testing and seeing what happens on their surface. So uh, the picture on the left is an example of a facility like this. Uh, it's a very long instrument. So you can see somewhere in the middle, there's two people uh, standing next to the instrument. So this is a several meters long thing that is just used to accelerate very small particles and impact them on rocks and study what happens, simulating what happens when a uh, dust particle that's flying through space hits the surface of a moon or an asteroid. And then the other way we can also simulate this is uh, using pulse lasers. So usually we know lasers that we can use to like point things or play with the cats, but there's a special kind of lasers that are used mostly in labs, which are very powerful. So they have a lot of energy uh, to the point that if you like use it to just point out your hand, it will get burnt because they have a lot of energy. And so uh, they use these kind of lasers in the lab same idea, you put a rock and then you shoot it with this laser and then it'll, it'll kind of create or melt something and, and put some energy in the rock and then change the properties. And this is simulating how the heat and the energy that one dust particle would put on the rock uh, would be similar to how uh, we're heating or melting a rock with the laser. So that's two ways we can simulate uh, micrometeorite impact. And the other side of this is how we can simulate the other type of particles, which are uh, the solar wind particles. So micrometeorites, even though they're very tiny for what we normally see in the, in the real world, 
uh, they're just like dust particles, so like uh, a grain of sand, for example. Uh, in the scientific world, there's even smaller things. So when we talk about the solar wind, we're talking about electrons and ions, which I said are atoms that are uh, lacking an electron or uh, just not uh, stable in their electronic structure. And so these are way smaller than a dust particle, but they also can cause a lot of things on the rocks that are found on the surface of airless bodies. So we can also simulate this in the lab. And for that, we use uh, something, a setup like this, and we'll see this actually later in, uh, in, in the lab tours that we'll do at the end of the presentation. Uh, but the schematic is showing the, the main components of this thing. So we have a, a special box that is a vacuum chamber uh, because we, when we're flying these small particles, we need to get the air out. We need to like simulate space where there's no air so that the particles can go and hit the rocks and not just heat the air in the way. Uh, and then we put all these instruments inside the vacuum chamber. So we have uh, an ion gun that sounds like a concept from a sci-fi movie, but ion guns are a real thing and we can use them in the lab. And what we do is we produce these ions and we accelerate them so they we shoot ions with this ion gun and they fly with the same uh, speed as the ions that are coming out from the sun because we know what speed the ions coming from the sun are going at. So we can do the same thing in the lab with this ion gun. So I put this little sun brand on the, on the ion gun on the schematic. Um, and then we put rocks. So the rocks that are found on Earth, but they have very similar composition to the rocks that we expect to be on the surface of the bodies that we're studying. And so we're shooting this uh, ions that are lo looking like solar wind ions, and then we're shooting at the rocks, and then we use these special detectors or cameras which belong to different instruments or different techniques that uh, uh, tell us something about what's going on at the surface of these rocks when they're being impacted. So uh, there's different types of instruments that will tell you different type of information. Some of them will tell you the physics of it, some of them will tell you the chemistry, the structure. So by combining different type of instruments, we get different information, then we put it all together, and then we can build a story and, and build an understanding of what is causing uh, these kind of changes in the lab. Okay, so now going on, we can see uh, what we can do when we are able to simulate a space environment. Because of course, like simulating a space environment is not easy as Camillo showed. So we need to uh, like choose very carefully then what we want to uh, study with this facility that sometimes are really complex and time consuming in uh, like producing results. So usually, the radiation experiment and the simulation of labor of like space environment are used to understand on one side the surface of the planets and the meteorites and the asteroids. So as Camille say, how the rocky surface is changed by the just the exposure to the space uh, environment. On my side, on the astrobiology side, we are more interested in another question that is strictly related to the uh, I would say. The effect of space environment on um, compound, but it in, in this case is the organic compound, the organic matter in the universe, because and in the solar system. Because from the astrobiology point of view, what we want to know is how, from a rocky surface of an asteroid, we are able now to speak about the rocky surface of asteroids. So how the human being, the first living cell, came out from the solar system and arrived to the complex city that we observe now on Earth. So uh, going to the first slide, we can see that um, in the solar system, we know that there is a lot of organic matter. We discovered organic matter on Mars, on asteroids and other planets like Ceres that you see on the um, bottom right corner, in icy moons, in comets. So, uh, in small bodies and rocky planets, we observe with a lot of space mission, a lot of time, the presence of organic matter. Moreover, we know that this organic matter is coming back to Earth thanks to the delivery that is um, made by meteorites and uh, inter inter interstellar planetary dust 
all this material is coming back, is coming down to Earth, is delivering organics on Earth. So we don't know, we don't know which is the, um, say, the mechanism that in the past history of Earth generated the first living being. So the question on how the life is, was generated on planet Earth is still open and is still need to be uh, like um, studied. This is also why we are like studying so uh, say in depth Mars because we believe that probably in Mars the same condition were present for the uh, the starting of life. And so if we are if we are able to find a compare um, a terms of compare comparison, maybe we will have the answer on the planet Earth. By the way, as you can imagine, like from the organic material. Is not strictly for work to have a uh, living being. So, from the building blocks of life, we have to find uh, how these building blocks of, of life can be assembled together in order to create life. In astrobiology, a lot of people are working on this effort. There are chemists, biologists that are working mostly on the process that. Uh, to say generated life once the material for generating life was available. On my side, as an astrophysicist, I'm more interested in uh, understand how this organic material can survive in a space environment that we see is so hard and so, I would say, affecting every compound. So all these organic molecules that are coming back on Earth coming down on Earth with meteorites, how can they survive in the space? So going to the next slide. Um, as Camilo said, there are a lot of effects that can, uh, I would say, uh, destroy molecule, organic molecule and biomolecule in space. Solar V, cosmic ray, ions, meteorites. Also, the, say, the only, I would say, changing in temperature, if it's very strict, strong, can affect the survival of this molecule. But we saw this molecule on Earth. We know that this molecule can survive in space. So we need laboratory study in order to understand how this molecule can survive. So going to the next. The work of astrobiologists is kind of mixed between uh, uh, chemists, physicists, and all the knowledge have to be combine it together in order to arrive to the results. So uh, most of my PhD I was like working in a laboratory that was mostly a chemical laboratory. So I was really mixing organic material with minerals in order to produce samples to be studied in the same facility that Camilo showed to you. So uh, to be radiated with ions, to be radiated with uh, UV, in order to understand how the interaction between minerals and rock can be the key to the survival of this molecule and the arrival on Earth. So let's imagine that we are producing a sample. So we are taking some molecule. We are taking some mineral or some meteorites. We have to clean the mineral from the organic molecule that they can like, have from the Earth contamination because we want to mix them with a particular organic. So imagine that you spend like 10, a lot of time washing this mineral and being sure that the mineral is um, um, so to be sure that this mineral is clean and then you attach the molecule you go to the lab you use giant facility in order to have uh, some result and most of the time the results are like this <laughs> just a line <laughs> on a chart that in principle it's very hard to to interpret but for our uh, I'm saying for our study, just a line like this is giving a lot of information. This is infrared spectrum. So it's the intensity, the reflectance of the sample uh, through the wavelength range of the infrared. And so if we look at all these features, all these little valley that we call band, we can have information. So going next, I can tell you that um, all these features are linked with a particular compound in the sample. So as you see, the, the one at four micron is linked with the carbonates and then there are organics, there is water. So studying how this spectrum is changing during the radiation can give us uh, 
information on how the material evolved in the universe. But of course, this is a simulation. Can be accurate as much as we want, but it's still a simulation. But now Camilo will show you how we can have access to the real matter of the universe to be studied in our lab. That's right. Uh, to kind of go to the last topic of our uh, talk will be the other very exciting thing we can do, but also very hard to do in the lab, and is working with real samples from space. Um, so here's a nice picture that actually Giovanni chose, uh, which looks like a, a shooting star, but it's actually a human-made object that flew very far away in our solar system, did something, and then came back to Earth and brought something back uh, for scientists to study. Uh, if anyone has ever heard of Hayabusa 2, uh, we'll talk more about it that in a bit. Uh, and just to give an overview here of the kind of types of missions that we can do and relating that to the data that we get to understand and then to use lab tools as a support to understand the data. Here's like a general uh, explanation of the type of missions that we can get data from. And this is not obviously a strict diagram because there might be missions that you know can do very different things. So the not necessarily fall there specifically. But for the most part, uh, the type of missions going from left to right, uh, they go from simpler, and I'm just saying simpler because uh, it will be harder to make something on the right side, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to do something that is on the left side. But for the most part, uh, it's simpler to build an observatory here on Earth because we can you know, we have all the tools that we can use. If we make a mistake, maybe we can fix it very easily. We have people working there, so it's very easy. And then maybe it's so, sort of still simple to put a uh, maybe a telescope orbiting around Earth. Uh, because like, even if it goes wrong, like with Hubble, uh, it was still possible to send a ship up to, to orbit Earth and then fix something. So still relatively simple. Then the next type of mission is a, a flyby. So that's just uh, a probe or a satellite or spacecraft that is just flying through space. There's a planet or a body, an asteroid, and it just flies through, but it gets close enough that we can maybe get a picture or get some information closer to the planet, but it's just like one flyby. So it just flies by the body and then leaves it. So it's only like a short window where you can get all this data and then it's gone. Um, so as you get closer on the bottom side, uh, you get because you're getting closer, your cameras can get more information. So you're getting starting to get smaller and smaller resolution of the data that you're getting. Um, then going next is an orbiter. So it's just a, a spacecraft that not only flies by the body that you want to study, but actually stays around orbiting. So you have plenty of time to take pictures, take, take data. You can stay orbiting for years on a planet and take data for years from that. And so you get a lot of nice. Uh, different data from that. Then going out in complexity and cost is when you actually land on that body. So we've heard a lot of the rovers that are on Mars, but there's different bodies on space that we visited and landed things on to study on site what's going on. So obviously you get so close, you're on the surface, you're, you can see things very close. So you're starting to see smaller details from, from the surface of these bodies or from their atmosphere or whatever you study. And then the last type, which uh, would be the sample return mission, which is the one we're talking about here, is when you go to the surface and then you pick up some material from the surface and then you leave that body and then you have to fly back all the way to Earth and then return to the surface of Earth to bring that material back to, to be studied in the lab. So here I have a collection of a very special and unique set of space bodies from our solar system. I think everyone knows the one on the left. If you don't know what's on the left, uh, I suggest you go out today and look out at the sky. Uh, it's the moon, obviously. But then I think the other three are not so famous. And uh, I like to set them up like this because they're just happy uh, that humans have visited them because these are very special asteroids. So. There's three asteroids, Ryugu, Bennu, and Itokawa. And these with the moon are the only bodies in the solar system that humans have sent a spacecraft, landed on the surface, picked up samples, and then returned those samples 
to Earth. So we have rocks here on Earth that come from the moon and then from these three asteroids, uh, or at least two of them, because actually Bennu uh, is a mission is part of a mission that is called Osiris Rex, which is currently it already visited Bennu and it's already flying back to Earth and it's expected to return the samples in September next year. So here's just an animation. So on the left, you have a video of uh, Hayabusa 2, which is when it touched asteroid Ryugu. And then on the right, you have the animation of uh, Osiris Rex touching the surface from Bennu. And so it's just like an arm going down on the surface. It shoots a projectile so that it causes rocks to fly off the surface. And then some of those rocks go into a capsule and then it captures it. And then it immediately leaves the surface and hopefully bring those back safely to Earth. And so obviously that's a very nice scenario because you actually have the samples in the lab so you can study them very, very closely and use this, all these nice techniques that we have in the labs here that are very hard to put in a space body otherwise. Like we have very nice uh, types of microscope and spectrometers on the lab that are just not very feasible to put on a spacecraft and send to space. So we only get to use those techniques when we have those samples brought back to Earth. Uh, so just giving a quick example of what we can learn from these samples when we bring them to Earth and when we study them in the lab. So on the left, we have uh, what we call the reflectance spectra of samples from the moon collected by the Apollo missions back in the 60s and 70s. And it's just showing how it was, uh, how studying, for example, the, the soil of the moon, which is just like the dust that is covering the surface of the moon versus rocks that were collected under the surface of the moon look very different even though they have the same composition and how uh, studying those kind of things actually led to discovering effects that take place in space. Um, and then on the center, we have uh, one image from a technique that is called tunneling electron microscopy or TEM, which is one of the, the techniques that gives us the best spatial resolution that we can achieve. So we can look at very, 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 very small things. Uh, so if you look at the bar at the bottom left of the center image, it says 50 nm, 50 nanometers. That is very, very, very small. And so you're looking at a very thin fraction of this little rock that they brought from an asteroid. And um, you can see detail that you will not be able to see with uh, an observatory on Earth or a flyby mission or uh, an orbiter, you have to have those samples in the lab. So that information, we can only learn it here with the techniques that we currently have. Um, and then just to show you an example of how valuable these samples are. So if you see that on the picture on the right, at the center, there's like a, a black rock. These are the type of samples that we get. Uh, I put a euro point there so you can compare kind of the size of, size of these rocks. They're very tiny, but uh, for people that study these kind of things, this is amazing. This is a lot of uh, material and you can get a lot of information with that. And because uh, there are scientists working with so many different type of instruments, uh, we can use different techniques to get different information from these things. And then we together can build a collective understanding of what's going on by combining these different techniques. So now we're moving on to the lab tour. So uh, if you give me one second, I'm going to turn around my computer to show you when I was uh, talking about the special chamber where you shoot ions uh, at a rock and then study what happens with those rocks. So I'm going to show you, oops, sorry. I think I'm going to stop sharing for now so that you can see the screen, the camera is better. So here's a special machine that we use to uh, simulate, for example, space environments. So if you look at that mess, somewhere there, there's a, a vacuum chamber where uh, we evacuate so we take the air out and then we put our special rocks in there. And so you see a lot of things pointing kind of at the same place because they're all instruments that are pointing at that rock that you put inside there. So you have like, for example, up here, 
we have what uh, the iron band that just that shoots ions towards that uh, rock, and then we have different instruments. Uh, you can have a label here, and those are just looking at that rock so that when we shoot it, we can study what's going on at that rock. So that's kind of like one uh, example of what these machines can look like to students. Just to very conclude our presentation, in order to understand what we can put inside this very huge instrument, I will show you and let me let's see, change a bit. So I will just the other, as you can see in my, I would say, my phone. What we can put inside this kind of machine is really um, something that can be found, I would say, sometimes easily on Earth, sometimes not, but it's really rocks, like uh, particular rocks sometimes, like for example, this black rock that you can see here is uh, lava from the Etna Vulcano in Sicily, so it's not really easy to get it, but I would say it's not so, um, so it's so special. On the other side, you can see something that is more common that you can really buy on the internet, but it's still a very interesting um, material is a simulant of Mars. So this is a mix of natural mineral that you can really find uh, outside in the garden sometimes or in mountain, but mix it in the same proportion in order to simulate what is the abundance of mineral that we observe on Mars. So I would say just two different kinds of material that we can have on Earth that can give us a lot of information when we have the special techniques to study in the lab. Just to finish, I will show you something that is a little bit more pressure. So you will see it's a, in a very, very small quantity. This is a, actually is not a rock that is coming from Earth. It's a rock that is from space. Is a little collection of rock from space. These are meteorites. So we know that meteorites can be like analogs of the. <laughs> I cannot, I would say, these are part of let's say, the space collection that we have that can give us information on the nature of the universe and the planetary body. And that, on the other side, they can be used to study the process because a meteorite on Earth is not only pressure because it's a testi testimony of like the material and the asteroid where it comes from, but can be used once we have in a I would say abundant uh, uh, material to study the process itself that is ongoing on the asteroids uh, in a particular asteroid in a particular space environment. So with this, I think. I can stop sharing and we are happy to answer to your question. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Camilo. I'm seeing in the chat that some people might have had an issue seeing uh, the, uh, the samples you showed with your phone. So maybe you can stop sharing the screen. And if you are able to show at least the small vials uh, with your other camera, with your uh, computer camera maybe that would be that would be awesome here we go uh, you're on mute you're on mute it's really a very very small amount in this case is a, a meteorite that is called Lande, but we have a, a bunch of meteorites for example this is a little bit more this is marches of meteorites. It's a very, very interesting meteorite because it's a carbonaceous meteorite. So it's bringing within a lot of information on the organic component in the universe. So I would say it's really different. Just to compare, this is the amount of marches that we have in the lab now. And this is the amount of Etna lava that I collected uh, on Earth. So it's you can easily understand like why using analogs mineral on earth that we can find on earth it's easier than like using 
like meteorites and other like real space analogs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's good that you, you have a lot of quantity of something a bit similar to start working on before you use the very precious material. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, this tour of techniques and, and understanding why we need to be in the lab to understand space exploration. It's, uh, it's really fascinating. So attendees, you have a Q&A panel in which you can ask questions. I see that we already have two of them. I'm going to ask a, an obvious one first, but then we'll go with uh, the questions there. Uh, you showed a panel of instruments that we that we have available to study everything from different scales and everything at different resolutions and with different techniques to study uh, to study the physical property or the chemical properties of, uh, of all, all of these uh, samples. Um, but then we hear about space missions where we only send uh, a specific instrument or two or maybe three uh, on a on the spacecraft or on the rover. Why don't we send them all if if we think all of them are useful? Who wants to answer that? I, I can start with that. Maybe Joanne will have more details. But uh, one of the main things is that every single gram that you put on a spacecraft makes things a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated. So you have to be very picky about uh, what kind of instruments you want to put on each spacecraft. And usually, uh, they, whoever is going to send the mission, whether it's ESA or JAXA or NASA, uh, they say, okay, we're going to send this mission. And then scientists will apply. So they will suggest, okay, I want to put this instrument. And there's a lot of different people wanting to put different things, but they cannot put everything. So they just do like a, a contest and then they end up choosing the best two or three uh, based on you know who's interested, what they want to do, the science that they're interested in. So uh, it's very hard to get to choose what they put in there. Um, so that's why we cannot put every single technique that we want. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Giovanni, do you want to add something? Just a, a very quick uh, thing that some instrument cannot be reduced to the dimension for a spacecraft. Like uh, we, we don't have the technology for some instrument to make it like in the space enough, like small to be placed on a spacecraft. So it's a very, I would say, uh, active field, the miniaturization of a like, current instrument that we have on Earth. But for some of them, we don't have the technology. So we cannot, also if we want, and also if we have money to send it, uh, we cannot send it because we cannot send an instrument that is big as a room on Mars. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for those answers. Yeah, it makes sense now that you say it. Okay, we have plenty of questions in the in the Q&A panel, so I'm going to go through them. Uh, I think the first one, since we, we ended on, on uh, analogs, uh, sample analogs, we have a question regarding those analogs. How do you choose the analogs without knowing exactly how the rocks from space are formed? Maybe I can go with this. Um, well, actually, let me show it again. It seems like someone didn't see it. Let's say this is like a mixture of Mars, a simulant of Mars that we produced on Earth. Actually, it's just a mixture of mineral that are easily found on Earth. And this simulant is the result of, I would say, years of planetary exploration. So, of course, it's a kind of back and I would say going back work that we have to do with the data. So we receive data. Let's imagine like the first probe on Mars. We obtained the first spectrum of Mars. So we have the spectrum. We don't know nothing about the surface of Mars. So we just say, okay, let's start maybe with the very general uh, class of minerals. So just to among the 3000 minerals on Earth, just to decide if we can like exclude some ca some class, some group of mineral, and then we start to you know like it's like a detective work. We start to you know uh, find the hints that the data are giving to us, and then we start to you know make the list of the suspect uh, <laughs> narrow, and then we arrive hopefully at the end to decide which is the most plausible composition for our surface. 
On the other side, we have also some, some help because like when we have on Earth also a little amount of meteorites like these, we can study the composition of these. And so we have an idea of what is the composition of asteroids. Of course, not all the asteroids are the same, but this is help us in order to choose the possible composition for other asteroids and to interpret the data from other asteroids that are not, for example, carbonaceous, like in this case. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Camilo. Do you want to add something to the, this answer? I was just going to add that uh, this is still an ongoing thing. So that doesn't mean that we know what everything is made of. Like, we don't know for certain what every planet has in every part of their surface. So it's an ongoing thing. We're constantly uh, furthering our understanding. And so we look at things, we compare them in the lab, and then we're slowly building that understanding of what we can find on the different uh, models. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so another question we got was about lasers, but I will I won't, uh, just uh, also like to include uh, ion guns in that. You mentioned you used lasers and ion guns, but how do you know the energy required uh, to simulate the actual energy received by the materials you're shooting? Okay. Um, this is for so... your... <laughs> With, with laser, so there's two, two answers, one for laser, one for ion. So for lasers, uh, we know from physics and from theory, we can understand if you shoot a material with light of a certain uh, wavelength or energy for a certain time and a certain power, then you know how much energy you're depositing on the surface. And you can also, with theory and with the equation, you can also study, if I have a particle of this size flying at this velocity, how much kinetic energy that has, or how much energy am I depositing into this? So I can equate those two things, and then I can choose uh, the energy of the laser to make it match the energy of a particle that is impacting um, a surface. And mm -hmm. we also can know like the temperature that the sample gets if it gets hit with the particle, so we can match the temperature that we put in with the laser on, on the, the target material. With ions, um, we have actual data. So we have satellites orbiting Earth, and we, we can collect actual particles from the sun. So we have, there's a nice website that tells you in real time what's the ions energy and speed and like all this information from the solar wind that is getting to Earth. So we can measure that information in space, and then we can use that in the lab to reproduce those conditions here. Okay, excellent. Giovanni, do you want to add anything before we move to the next question? Okay, you're uh, I think Camilo. Okay. Um, all right. So the next question is also about the samples that you study. Are they destroyed after you study them? Does the machine, the instrument you use, break the rock? Giovanni, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. I would say it depends. I would say. If we are simulating a space environment, the sample are not destroyed sometimes, but of course they are altered. So they are not anymore the sample that we uh, have at the beginning of the experiment. So mm -hmm. also when we use like simple rocks, once we start to irradiate with the lasers and ions, we change the structure of at least the surface of these rocks. So if the rock is very big, maybe the inner part is still like pristine, but the surface, of course, will be altered. I would say we don't have probably like uh, uh, lasers that are enough powerful to break the rock, but of course we can really alter the surface, uh, changing not only like the let's say the physical properties, but also the the, the look like how the, the rocks look like. So maybe we can just really burn uh, rocks and like change the surface. Uh, but this is related to the, uh, say, to the um, to the radiation experiment. So when we simulate the radiation, on the other side, the technique that we use to study most of the technique that we study are not alterating the, the sample. So this is the the we say the trick of the experiment. So we have a source of alteration that is the radiation, and like a just a, an eye, a detector. Uh, or say a view of the sample that is changing through the time, but the technique itself is not altering the sample. So we can just really know the effect of the source that we choose. 
Oh. Right, Camilo, do, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I can add that. So yeah, it depends on the technique that you want to use, the thing that you want to look at. But for example, with return samples, it's even more uh, complicated because these are obviously very precious. We only have a limited amount of these rocks. Um, so not everyone gets to do whatever they want and not everyone gets to do some destructive techniques. So usually what they do is that they start with the techniques that do not alter it, and then they start going to maybe techniques that like change a little bit and then end with techniques that just uh, you know, have a rock and then turn it into powder to study the, the strength of the grain of the rock. So yeah, it depends what you want to do. And also who else wants to study that because you don't want to destroy something that a lot of other people will just get fresh information from that. Mm -hmm. All right. And this makes makes me think that um, there is something else with that, right? It's that when we bring back samples on Earth, we have possible contaminations of the sample, right? Because we are surrounded, and even like if you if you are working in a lab where you have a simulant, and then for some reason there is a bit of that simulant in the air and it it deposits on your sample, then you get everything messed up, right? So how do you avoid this kind of contamination? Go ahead. Okay, okay uh, I can start. So, uh, yeah, I think a very important thing uh, is that. Earth is very dirty for, for science. So for things in space, because we know everything in space doesn't have air. When we want to simulate things up here, Earth is your enemy because it's gonna contaminate everything that you put in uh, exposed to air. So we have a lot of this vacuum chamber, we have a lot of these uh, facilities. Some of them are called glove boxes. So they're like a closed environment that you can put your hands in with gloves, with special gloves, and you can, manipulate the samples without ever having air go in there. So yes, it's very important, uh, depending on what you want to study, to make sure and use expensive and nice facilities to be able to prevent air and dirty things from Earth to ever getting into your samples. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, if I can add like a very short thing is that uh, this is also why, like the, the fact that Earth is contaminating everything, is also why we need sample recognition because like one of the first questions that people can ask is like, if I can like have on earth for free, a piece of asteroids that is falling down, why I need to spend like a lot of money to go to the same asteroids maybe to take a, a sample that in principle is the same. But of course, for example, Marchison fall down in the sixties. And since the sixties, it's like, <laughs> On Earth, so most of the, I would say, the pieces that we have of marches on meteorites are contaminated. We know that they are contaminated. We have some study that can help us to understand which is the part that is contamination and which is not the part that is contamination. But for meteorites that fall down in the eight, in the, I would say, in the 18th century or even before, we don't have any possibility to understand and to be sure that the meteorites was like how much the meteorite was contaminated, because we have to start thinking about that it was contaminated, how much it was contaminated. And also, if we think about like the very, um, I would say the very optimal condition. So we saw the asteroids or the piece of asteroids arriving and we just wait <laughs> on Earth to bring the, to, to take the, the pieces that are arriving on Earth. We have to think about that this small piece of rocks just crossed the entire atmosphere to arrive on Earth. So if the atmosphere didn't contaminate the the, aster, the meteorites with like organics, at least the, the re-entry process altered the surface of the asteroid with thermal. So there is no way that we can have on Earth something that is pristine. Mm -hmm. This is why we need, uh, uh, say, to go there and to really be sure that the sample we take, it's like, isolated from everything, from the spacecraft itself, because we cannot be really sure that the entire spacecraft is super clean. So the same, the only part that is super clean is the mechanism to collect the sample and the sample capture. And I would say, just to understand also, this is why the meteorites is, is a, in a sealed vials and I can, I can bring like the rocks by hands and with their supposed to hey, because like the rocks on Earth are like 
really common and also we don't really are interested in the organic part of the rocks on earth so if i need yeah. to use this uh, stimulant for a study i will just clean all the organic i will just leave the mineral part and i will clean it with the meteorites since there are organics in there that are coming from space it's a tricky question to clean a meteorites in order to have only the pristine part because we are maybe cleaning also the organic part of the meteorites Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Um, so I would like to conclude with a, uh, the last question that we have. Uh, and it's one for the both of you. Uh, the question is, how did you decide to become a planetary scientist? Who wants to go first? Camilo? Uh, I, I can go first. Uh, I think it's a kind of a mix between passion and opportunity. So I think since I was a kid, I always was, you know, passionate about space. I loved science fiction movies. I loved looking at uh, reading books and looking movies, watching movies about space, uh, learning about the missions that the different agencies around the world were doing. Uh, and then I was also passionate about science. So I was, you know, following a path doing studying something in the university and then going to grad school to become a scientist. But it's also a mix of opportunity because that's eventually I met someone that had the project that I could join to go into that field of planetary science. So it was a mix of passion and, and chance. All right. Thanks. Giovanni? Okay, since I'm a little bit older, let me make me a joke. Because planetary scientists is the closest thing to sci-fi that we have on Earth, actually, because we are working with spacecraft and like space sample, but uh, I would say, apart from the joke, uh, um, I can tell you why I decided to become a laboratory planetary scientist. And I think it's the same uh, for Camilo, because like in planetary scientists, we have really a multitude of disciplines that are like mixing together. You can be a planetary scientist uh, from uh, geology, from chemists, from uh, astrophysics, even from like more theoretical studies like math if you need to simulate how maybe the dynamics of planetary bodies working uh, for me like working in lab is really giving me the opportunity to touch at least like in the with, with the <laughs> with all the, the precaution but to touch the sample i really feel that i'm uh, part of the of the science because it's not really just numbers on my computer at the end they will become numbers of my computer when i have to make the analysis but it starts with me in the lab really creating and assembling an instrument to perform something that it's it's real it's a part of the real world and we stay in the world because also like the sample that we radiate it's something that we made and it will change uh, the knowledge that we have of space and solar system Thank you. Thank you, both of you. I think it will be time to go. I just want to let you know that uh, in the chat, we have people telling us that it was an amazing webinar and that you are a great inspiration for the next generation. So thank you for your time, Giovanni and Gabilo, for being here today, showing us the lab too. That was amazing. Um, people in the chat, uh, you will be receiving an email to participate in the feedback to help us improve. Camilo, if you could share just the, the slides so that everyone get such sense to see also on the live stream and the recordings. Uh, yes, so you can use that link to, to um, uh, tell us more about what you thought and help us improve. And with all of that, I want to thank you all again for attending this webinar. Um, and thank you to our speakers for being with us today. I wish you all the great rest of your day and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.